All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I'm joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well, thank you. Right on. Today's podcast is with our good friend, Jim Heffelfinger. He's um, out of the Arizona Game and Fish, or Fish and Game Department. The reason we had Jim on, first of all, he's awesome. He was just on the Meat Eater <laughs> podcast, too, so you can double up on a little Jimmy stuff this week. Uh, on Instagram, on, podcast. on Instagram, he's Jim Deer. D-E-R-E, I think. Yeah, like the tractor. Like the tractor. We had him on because I returned from Arizona, did a mule deer slash coos deer, mostly coos for me, mule deer for lampers, <laughs> and we did a hunt down there. Brad was with us, intern Brad. Uh, Brad and I killed some coo- killed a coos deer. Ryan shot a mule deer. We had a great hunt, and we had some takeaways from that hunt. I, I covered some Arizona application slash draw strategies for Arizona. Uh, Needless to say, every time I talk about a state specifically, a lot of people that listen to the show or or watch the show that uh, have a stake in the area I'm talking (laughs) about are not happy with me. Mm -mm. The rest of the the nation is pretty thrilled. So, well, I get it, Brian. When's the last time you do Prince of Wales? I haven't drawn Prince of Wales since I did my last podcast (laughs) on Prince of Wales. Who knows? I mean. I do notice that when we talk about some places, they can blow up. There's no mm-hmm. question. It's not just me. It's other. Well, let, let me read this comment. That's kind of, we built this podcast kind of off of this comment on Instagram. I made a post about the hunt in Arizona. And here's a comment from, uh, from Dave AZ Hunter on Instagram. He said, Arizona hunting is on the decline. Mule deer are hurting like I have never seen. Areas that held great mule deer 20 years ago have been taken over by coos deer. As for tags and quality, he, he talks about how residents asked for more opportunity instead of quality. So that's what Game & Fish gave us. But people don't understand what they ask for. More opportunity doesn't mean more shots at deer. It means more tags in the field. Equals more pressure, more hunters, more deer killed. Hunting is nothing like it was in the 80s. Uh, I was used to seeing big deer often. Now, lucky to get drawn every five to six years. Archery hunts end up competing with guys on every hill, hilltop, glassing. In another 20 years, even archery tags will be draw. With YouTube channels galore about hunting areas, few areas will remain secretive. Hunting is becoming a rich man sport. If you have the money for landowner tags and guide fees, you will enjoy great tags. I appreciated Dave's input and... A lot of people chimed in. We had some near an 80 comments that are as long or longer than that on this post. <laughs> so it was a controversial subject. So we had Jim come on and actually address mule deer in the 80s, mule deer today. Because he's been in fishing game since he was like 18, hasn't he? <laughs> he's been in fishing game for a long time. He Seriously. says in the podcast. And he broke down how Arizona has come up with their strategy for managing deer. Uh, one of the concerns I had in my post was, hey, why don't you manage the archery tags for coos deer separately from your archery tag for mule deer? Since Makes they're sense. obviously different species and they're, they're, they have totally different situations, uh, I can see a completely unlimited, unfettered, unblocked you know, season for coos deer. It's mm-hmm. like year-round practically until yeah. you tag out versus mule deer might need to be a draw. I don't know. So we sat down and we talked about that and some things were real eye-opening for me, including the current status of uh, the mule deer population in the United States, its health or lack thereof. I'll give you a hint. It's it's healthy and strong pretty, for the most part, according to Jim, um, deer biologist. So it's a very, it's a very informative podcast. I think you're going to like it. Take a listen. Let us know what you think. Leave comments on the, on our YouTube channel. We try to respond to those and DM us if you got more questions, follow up. But it was real eye opening because every state struggles with non resident tags, resident versus resident tags, how those are going to go about rifle versus bow, season dates, and so on. They all struggle and they all have different methods for handling the demand. I really enjoyed the show with, with Jim. I think you're going to value it as well and, and uh, let us know what you think. Before I get into the show, I want to read a few comments. We Brent and I have been working our butts off publishing film, hunt films. And this month we published a few, two series. We did 
elk with our my daughter Caitlin and mm-hmm. and Anthony, my buddy Anthony, and his son Brock. Those have done really well. If you haven't seen them, check them out. And I just published a whitetail hunt with my buddy Sloan Brown uh, in Texas, a spot and stock whitetail hunt. And I just want to read some of the comments that we've been getting uh, for those who haven't been listening, uh, or for those who haven't been watching the YouTube videos. Go check them out because they're cool. And uh, here are some of the comments. Uh, Justin uh, Torsgren, Tor- Torgerson. Justin Torgerson says, "Dude, I grew up in Illinois hunting whitetail, and the mention of spot and stock whitetail would have made my grandfather and everyone else I knew laugh hysterically. Now I live in eastern Montana and have noticed some amazing whiteies in what I think is very stockable ground, but I never had the balls to try because of this installed preconceived notion that it can't be done." I will not make this mistake again in all exclamation caps. all caps. <laughs> I'll make sure and send pics of my 2020 spot and stock whitetail via gritty. Thanks, Brian. By the way, you guys are killing it with the content, keeping me soothed until I can get going in September. Thanks again, man. Super cool comment. Uh, I'm going to be expecting a picture here by the end of the year. <laughs> that's right. One of the reason I was really curious. Uh, one of the reasons I like this comment is when we were out at Sloan's place, I I was saying. Dude, after hunting in Alberta for mule deer, I was looking around at Sloan's property going, this place is perfect for spot and stock. Mm -hmm. You can watch these deer go off and bed in these big areas, and Mm -hmm. it's thick, but you can can definitely... There's lots of micro topography around. And they're rutting, they're distracted, it was open. Uh, After a few days, we talked them into doing it, and it actually worked really well. And and you, if you go watch the film kind of break down our tactic, how we did it, walk you through our strategy. And one of the things I think when you're in, inside 20 yards of a buck, mm-hmm. when it stands up, the first thing that buck does is like do 360 scan. Yep. It looks in all directions. And when you're inside that bubble, it's hard to be invisible, mm-hmm. you know? So we use the tactic. You should go check it out. If you haven't seen it, those who have know what I'm talking about. We use a tactic that I felt like could work but, I, but I've learned from trying this in the past that if you start too aggressive, too close, you just blow them out. You, you just agitate them. So this was pretty cool. Check it out. Uh, another comment that we got was from Jason York. He said, I love the awesome drawing illustrations. The best part about the video is you could tell you were having a good time the entire time. Uh, yes. Intern Brad, those, those, uh, art skills are intern uh-huh. Brad all the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, he built a diagram for us to, to, to illustrate the stock and how it was the plan. Yeah. The plan. It looks like something a kindergarten kid would put together, but dang, <laughs> he made it in paint with emojis. <laughs> yeah. It works. It worked great. I don't care. Gets the, <laughs> it gets the job done. So we can thank intern Brad for that stellar. It's so cheesy. It's awesome. Uh, Nate Merkley, he says, after hunting mule deer for 25 years, I think this is the year I try hunting whitetail for the first time. Congrats, Brian, on a great buck. I love whitetail, dude. I think guys out west are missing out. It's you know, and and whitetail coos deer are even more switched on than I think your typical whitetail mm-hmm. in the Midwest and so on. Certain areas are so thick. Spawn stock's going to be tough, mm-hmm. uh, you know. And it, or even terrain's too loud, let's say. But you get a wind, some weather, open country. Kansas looks blown. totally stockable <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, everybody should give whitetail a, a try. Plus, it's easy to get a whitetail tag. Mm-hmm. Get them away. They're all over. It's, it's hard to get access, but it, it is easy to get the tag. I think it's weird that whitetail have that stigma against them. What? What stigma? Access? No, not access. Um, oh. People look down their nose at them. Well, we had Eastern a- guys love them. Western, yeah. Midwest, uh, yeah. Western guys kind of think are think their their deer, their mule deer, or their black tail, or whatever mm-hmm. are are the cats meow. They're all awesome, in my opinion. I love how aggressive whitetail are. They're just on the next level of cocky, mm-hmm. and that's fun to hunt. <laughs> that's why I like tar. I've hunted mountain goat, and I've hunted tar. Mountain goat are easy to kill. <laughs> they just are. It, when someone goes and shoots a mountain goat with a boat, I, I I don't really care. Like it's not an impressive feat to me, mm-hmm. except in the fact that the terrain is a challenge. Mm-hmm. Like I'll give it to you. Like if you get in bow range and some of those cliffs and some of those areas, 
that's impressive to me. Mm-hmm. Just just getting and shooting and retrieving but, it. But but stalking it or sneaking up on it or mm-hmm. tricking it or fooling it? No. Nope, sorry. Goats are easy. <laughs> but tar, they're not like that. They're more like a sheep. More like from I've never hunted sheep, but everyone I've spoken to and from what I've seen, sheep are switched on. Doll sheep, bighorn sheep, you know, they see you, they're gone. And that's really more like a tar. And so I like that challenge because you're still in that terrain that can be deadly Mm -hmm. and intense, but you're chasing an animal that's also switched on and paying attention, you know. And it's cool with running 10 miles across a mountain range to get away from you. Yeah, it is cool watching them just go straight up a cliff. (laughs) Like the, 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 the most, the tar I, my first hunt to New Zealand, some tar just went straight up like a a wall like a it was like they climbed the side of the empire state building you're just like <laughs> what it was cool mr sockeye says that was a super sweet hunt as per all the gritty films i have watched it was beautifully shot in the finest quality of film i really like the coat on that buck he had an almost orangish orangish red tint on him uh we filmed that a few years back actually it's not the best footage but but i think it was well edited the coat on that buck though gorgeous he's a cool looking buck in fact he's he's at the taxidermist getting mounted because his cape is so unique we have video of all kinds of bucks that weekend Mm -hmm. his cape is incredible he looks solid red with double throat white or white well the thing is we have we have four different cameras that captured this hunt from gopro to phones to expensive cameras to cheap video cameras and all four cameras are used to tell this story. <laughs> and so it depends which camera angle you're looking at. You have some really high quality footage and you have some real low quality footage. But there's some video of that buck on the run and, and you see what his coat really looks like. And he just he just gorgeous. The other movie that we released is the one with Anthony. Uh, my buddy Anthony and his son Brock and my daughter Caitlin and I. It's kind of a daddy-daughter hunt, dad, father-son hunt where we go into some gnarly country and shoot a nice bull. And uh, that was Brock's hunt. People love the hunt. It's really cool. I really appreciate all the engagement there. Travis Carraway said, this is a quote that I did in the film, every kid should ditch school and go hunting. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yes, yes, they should. And then another guy, uh, Roy Boussard, he said, lessons in the field are as important as lessons in the classroom. And I totally agree. I think when I look back on the the informative times in my life, the, the, the times in my life that inform who I am today, those experiences I learned on hunts where I was ditching school were more more poignant and made it more a bigger difference in my life than the days in the classroom. Mm-hmm. You know. First time I went elk hunting was with you, dad, Uncle Bill, cousin Ben. I skipped two weeks of school. Yeah, that was gnarly, too. That was stupid. That was like negative 20 degrees, and Brent showed up in like jeans and tennis shoes. No one no one told me what to bring. We that had, was your father's fault. We had meetings where we sat down and talked about what we needed to pack. No one brought up clothes. I wore uh, jeans that entire trip. So we have a film coming out this Sunday, mm-hmm. basically in two days. Late that season one, rifle one elk. Day, and it's a late season rifle elk hunt with my buddy Dwayne Sessions. And he saw fit to leave a comment on the elk and Caitlin, the Caitlin and Brock video mm-hmm. of the elk hunt. Cause Dwayne is hunted with my daughter, Caitlin and I a couple times. And Dwayne said, uh, I said in the film, she's not the fastest, but, but she gets the job done. Mm-hmm. And Dwayne's like, by whose definition? <laughs> Most people go regular s- speed, Brian, Ryan. I think there's another gear built in those guys. He says, uh, Caitlin is going to be one bad A chica. She is always able to dig deep, deeper and find her next level. And yeah, Caitlin has some stamina. She's tough. The elements don't get to her. She works hard. Like I said, speed is not her thing, but she's like, this tough diesel never complained with a tough attitude. So I love, I love taking her out there with me. Her and Brock, man, neither one of them complained. Yeah. Uh, one last comment I'll read. This one is 
says, Brian, I love your grit, your style, and your friendships with some of the most amazing people you hunt with. Thank you for taking the time to share your memories with us. I strive to be the best person and hunter I can be, and your videos inspire this passion. Hunting is not a hobby, it's life. I hope to meet you someday. Thanks again, Steve from Oregon. That's cool. Uh, one more. What Mike Williams, he said, you guys are blessed to be suffering with your kids at your side. The hard times help build character and grit and are the times to look back on and retell. Thanks for taking us along. Super cool. Check out the videos if you haven't. The mule deer hunt I did with Lampers, Ryan Lampers. That one's on fire. It's done really well. Uh, moose hunt. The, the moose hunt was has done well. We're excited about the, the content on the video side that we're producing. Uh, we'll get this next video out on Sunday with Dwayne. Hope you enjoy that hunt. And after that, we're going to take a month a off. month to produce another uh, four parts before, you know, more, another four episodes to release in uh, April. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's dive into the podcast. Don't forget, friends, use the code gritty at Mountain Ops and you will save on shipping on all your Mountain Ops orders. And it helps us at the podcast use the code gritty at sissy sticks and you'll get 15% off a pair of sweet carbon fiber slash aluminum trekking poles mm -hmm. that have withstood the test of time. They're great poles are lightweight. They're tough. They're the perfect blend. A similar set. I think at REI is going to be 225 bucks or so. Mm -hmm. And you're picking them up with our code for around one ten ten or something. It's a steal. It's an absolute steal. And then get 15% uh, off at Heather's cho choice, Heather's choice using the code gritty. 15% off is pretty good. You get mm -hmm. some packaroons, get some entrees, get some salmon chowder for all your weekend adventures. Mm -hmm. And we have another partner dun, working with dun, us. Dun. We've actually been using Valkyrie Broadheads for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And all of you know, I've done multiple podcasts about it. I love the heads. It's not cheap. I ha I will say I've sent them through concrete walls. Cousin Ben has. Mm -hmm. uh, they got a lifetime warranty on the heads. Uh, as long as you don't lose them. As long as you don't lose them. And they're, they're incredible. Get 5% off those heads if you use the code GRITTY and get yourself set up on, well, fi get 5% off at uh, Valkyrie Archery. So with that, jump into the show. Enjoy. Let us know what you think. Thank you. Stay gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call. And today, my guest is Jim Heffelfinger. Uh, Arizona State, um, State Wildlife of Arizona. Science Coordinator. Wildlife Science Coordinator. Okay. So uh, you've got a background in biology? Yep. Yep. A bachelor's and master's in wildlife ecology. Okay. And we, we've had some discussions before. You've been on the mm -hmm. podcast. You've been a guest. Uh, and, um, it, you know, I just returned from Arizona, was down there hunting archery yeah i just missed you and i saw ryan i know in camp but i didn't see you. ryan swung by and showed off his uh success <laughs> uh and we we did a a podcast about arizona recently and you know it was covered in some of our social media stuff and i got a coos deer again yeah um unbelievable <laughs> i'd say you're above average archery coos deer <laughs> so i want to get into that a little bit because ryan shot a mule deer i shot a coos deer and Brad got a mule deer or a coos deer as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I saw that. So we killed it with our little camp. You know, we were a fifty percent success rate over there. Killer camp, yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. Um and you know, for people who don't know, this is the third year that I've been able to go down to Arizona and hunt deer archery over the counter. And it's a it's also the hunts in like well, December, January, mm -hmm. February, mm -hmm. and even August, yep. some of September. Yep. Right. So Arizona has a, 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 a an incredible archery deer over the counter opportunity that anybody can go and do. Mm -hmm. And we've been highlighting that for a few years now. So most of our listeners are quite aware of this hunt, mm -hmm. and some have been down. Yeah, and and we <laughs> we went down there with Randy Newberg the first time. And most of the game and fish guys from Arizona, uh, that was a couple, three years back. And, uh, that's when I got to shoot a Kawada Monday yeah, that's right. and, uh, eat that with Hank Shaw, <laughs> our small game chef. And if you haven't heard those podcasts, you got to go check them out. And 
we kind of break down what happened in Arizona, what the, what the opportunities were like. And it was pretty amazing. Now, yeah. fast forward three years, Randy Newberg's blabbing his mouth about Arizona. <laughs> and I guess, I guess I am too. So is Hosh. So is the hunting public. <laughs> yep. And we encourage that. And, um, and now there's a lot, there's a few people a little angry at us that, that have been hunting down there for a while and, and they've noticed an increase in pressure. Sure. And, um, <clears throat> so one thing I wanted to talk about today with you, Jim, being that you're with the department and you've, you've been part of these decisions and, and how you manage the wildlife right. for 23 years, I was the, the regional game biologist for Southeastern Arizona. So all hunt recommendations and season setting and everything went through me. So that's because if I, if I look back on the first year I went to Arizona, then the second year and the third year, the amount of pressure and the amount of people that I saw this year was exponentially higher than three years ago, two years ago. And then now it is higher overall. Definitely. Cause we noticed the first year, two years ago with Randy, we sat out there in glass and I think we saw one vehicle and there were quail hunters. Yes. I and mean, there's like nobody out there. And so, you know, that's not right either. There's a lot of resource out there that people could take advantage of. Well, I felt like it was ridiculous. The number of, <coughs> of, of whitetail, like coos deer, Boone and Crockett size coos deer, um, just everywhere. You could see and, from the road and there yeah, was nobody there hunting. Nobody there hunting. <laughs> I didn't have to like get off the road. I know, but that's true. And I could go on multiple stocks a day. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they didn't last long because coos deer are tough and it <laughs> took me a while to figure out the best sort of tactics on those deer like which climbing is, trees and yes deer other trees. like like the amount of patience that it takes i think for me to get close to another animal is 10 times as high on a coos yeah deer. those the, the successful people have a high patience and i i don't i tend to fools rush in i get impatient i want to make something happen it's mostly like i just get within 100 or 110 yards and then I sit and hope mm -hmm. that they'll come closer. Sure. Especially if they're moving does around, kind of moving around. Because it's too, it's just to close that last distance, they're just too sharp. They're too mm -hmm. wary. They're too alert. It, they're, if they're distracted and it's just one buck and one doe and they, they're, there's not much else around to, to, that's on alert, then yeah, you can kind of move in because mm -hmm. they're busy. But Remember I quoted you in a magazine article calling them twitchy. They are twitchy. <laughs> I mean, they're like... They're so crazy alert. And that brings me to the next point is, you know, all three years I've been there, I've chased coos deer. There's mule deer there. Some guys in camp hush and uh, hunting public spent some days hunting mule deer. And they, they were kind of like, yeah, forget this coos deer thing. This mm -hmm. mule deer thing is a lot easier. We we're getting close. We were, they weren't even getting close on the coos. Yeah. And, and I can see how it's a little discouraging. And they're, they're harder to spot. The coos deer, mule deer kind of just pop out of the landscape. Yep. More rugged country, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they're in the rocks and the brush much more than mule deer. But so this year, I, I saw the, the vids from uh, the hunting public, and they use their whitetail tactics. They're, they're rattling and they're mm -hmm. snort wheeze and the grunts, and yeah. <clears throat> they were getting these bucks to come real yeah. close. To, I find that really interesting when someone with a completely fresh perspective comes down and tries new things. That's really interesting. Yeah. I came from uh, a South Texas and Eastern whitetail background um, too. And so I came my first year and I thought I was going to kill one with a pistol and that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've noticed um, that increase in pressure. And this year, as we spent more time, you know, Anthony, my, my buddy, Anthony and, and uh, Ryan, they chased mule deer and Ryan shot a real nice mule deer. Um, it was very crowded around the mule deer areas where the mule deer and the coos deer overlapped. If we went off in the, in the coos deer only regions, uh, we still had a lot of hunting pressure. We ran into more than I, than I've experienced mm -hmm. in the past. Generally though, we had there to ourselves. There was no risk yep. that someone was going to go in and blow, blow your coos yep. to your stock. And too, when you, when you talk about pressure being exponentially higher this year, <clears throat> sometimes it just depends on where you are. Sometimes you just happen to be in a cluster. Yeah. Anybody when they're out hunting, sometimes you, I'll go to the same area. We've got some favorite areas our family's gone to for 20 years plus. In some years, same number of tags in the unit every year. Some years we go to that hill and there's everybody. Everybody's mm -hmm. there. Other years we go and we like, don't see anybody Friday and Saturday. 
So it does. It depends too. Sometimes just it on, does. Just it's anecdotal for sure to, mm-hmm. to to look at it this way. But we did cover some serious ground, and where we've never seen campers or people camped, or yeah. we saw them everywhere. No doubt, there's more. Mm-hmm. My question is, you know, and I know from from people who've written in that are a little frustrated that that they're they're concerned with the popularity. They're concerned mm-hmm. with us talking about the hunts down there. The thing is, is I talk about hunts across the states, like all of them. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like I hit all states pretty equally hard that I go to. Uh, but at the same time, I try to respect what's out there. And, and all plat- I mean, most of the platforms do. They don't mm-hmm. reveal where it is. Someone, someone comments and say, where were you guys? And they don't. I usually don't delete the where. comments. Or if they put in mm-hmm. where I was at, I delete it. And I don't want to. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I feel like. If I have fifty thousand people watch a video yeah. and they read the comments, right? I, every and that's being respectful of the local resident hunters. I know Randy Newber does that too. If there's someone comments and says, "Oh, I know where you are. You're right at," yeah, he'll delete it just out of respect for not piling a lot one of, of people. In one there. of our mutual friends had a picture and a GPS point of where a giant mule deer was, <laughs> and I'm like, "All right, hand it over." You know, <laughs> yeah. so he gave it to me, <laughs> and I was like, "Wow." Um, and I said to Randy, he was, I said, Randy, are you going to go, um, go after it, man? Like you should go after it. And Randy is all, yeah, no, Brian, um, <laughs> I'm already hated enough for talking about this. If I go chase mule deer and blow that up, mm-hmm. I'm going to be in trouble. Yep. And, and, like, and that my whole concern. point here is to promote the whitetail, right? Because it's an under, underutilized Utilized. resource. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's absolutely true. And I'm concerned too. I don't, I wouldn't want so much um so much focus being on mule deer in arizona because they're they live in a much more open country they're easier to get to they're easier to see they're easier to sneak up on and and so the mule deer resource isn't as resilient as our white tail the, the cows white tails in such a so remote rugged areas they're more abundant um at that time and they they can they can withstand a lot more opportunity to let people hunt those Mule deer, not so much. Mule deer throughout the 90s, the late 80s and, and 90s, mule deer declined throughout the West. And the mule deer working group that I chair was actually assembled because of this decline in the early 90s to try to look at, at solutions. Now, sometimes you hear people talk about mule deer decline throughout the West, that it's declining. And truth is, mule deer are not declining throughout the West anymore. They, they've actually responded and come back up from that 1990s decline in most agencies throughout the west or mule deer populations are stable or slightly increasing almost all of them below where they like them to be so yeah. it's not like everything's rosy but you know we shouldn't be talking about the mule deer decline but my point is back in the 90s mule deer populations dropped and in, in, in the southeastern arizona those desert mule deer populations became lower in abundance lower in density and when that happened we did see some um, cows whitetail populations kind of slide down in elevation or a whitetail or higher elevation, mule deer are down in the flats. And we did see some whitetail populations come down and we'd start seeing whitetail in some areas that were formerly mule deer. Just right, they weren't taking over the mule deer habitat, but just right in that interface, you'd start to see a little mm-hmm. more whitetail. And I think that was just a function of not whitetail out competing or driving mule deer out, but mule deer population going down and there was some kind of vacant habitat and, and whitetail started using that. And I suspect as mule deer populations increase, which they are, it's just a guess on my part, but I, I expect that to, to kind of go back to where they were because ecologically they've, they, they divide out by elevation there. And I think things will go back a little bit and you'll see those white tails recede up, up slope a little bit. It is odd because, you know, we've chased mule deer in that 10, 12,000 feet in some mountains that are just nasty. <clears throat> That's right. And, and then you go to Arizona and, and, and you expect to see, I don't like white tails in the river bottoms mm-hmm. or this valley bottoms. Mm-hmm. And you, you expect to see mule deer up on these mountains. Yeah. But they're not like that. No, Southwest is, is reversed from what everybody's familiar with in the West, where you've got mule deer in the mountains and whitetail in the valleys and the riparian, the river areas. And in the Southwest, our little whitetails are up above 4,000 feet in elevation in the oak woodland and then up in the ponderosa pine. And mule deer are in the flat mesquite grasslands and Sonoran Desert with saguaro. So it's at just completely reversed. But it's interesting, as you go up to uh, Flagstaff, where you've got 
down in southeastern Arizona, you have all these white tails up in the ponderosa pine and the oaks. Mm-hmm. And then you get up to Flagstaff and you run out of whitetail. They're not really farther north than Flagstaff. And there's very few around that just north edge of Flagstaff. And you have all mule deer occupying habitat that looks similar to what the whitetails are occupying. I know. So it's it, really a complex <laughs> relationship. And I, in almost 30 years of dealing with deer down here, I haven't figured it out yet. It's just it's it really, is really strange. One thing that's cool is, you know, to, to chase the whitetails up in those mountains, it's like you're chasing a high country mule deer. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're beautiful mountains. They're up there, you know, running around. They're hard to spot, but here's what I found. Um, you know, if you, they're, they're, first of all, they're probably one of the best animals. If you want an archery challenge, if you want to challenge yourself, there's a, there's a, and you want to get better at spot and stock. And that includes the ability to find an animal through a Mm -hmm. spotter spot. Yeah. They're, and and they are so difficult to see. They're difficult. Once you spot them, they're difficult to keep your eyes on them. I know. I, I <laughs> that killed me a few times. Um, they disappear on a, on a fairly open hillside. They they'll be standing still. You can't find. I again. found like there's a sweet spot where I have to have a certain level of magnification, or I'm hosed. Mm-hmm. Like they will just kind of move, and you won't see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually have found I need to be a, at a certain yardage with the, with a certain power. Or I don't have a chance of kind of keeping them when they cross a whole hill, chase a doe, and go into a thicket and come back out. Yeah. They're just too easy to miss. Or they'll step behind a bush and they'll stand there for 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, 20 minutes is a long time to look at a bush. Mm-hmm. And after 20 minutes, then you're second-guessing yourself. I must have missed him. I think yep. he's gone. No, I, I had a buck that had come across. I'd been watching for all morning, but the sun was glistening on it. And so it was really reflective and it just popped. Mm-hmm. But then when that sun changed and the shadows came and he walked around into this basin, I was watching it and he just, I couldn't see him. And I watched and I watched and I watched for like 10 minutes. And then finally he took a step (laughs) and he's in the exact same spot (laughs) that he was the whole time. Mm -hmm. I just, there was impossible to see him. He just blended with the rocks and the cover and the shadows and there, those gray ghosts for sure. So I, I think that's fascinating. The mule deer, though, they seem like almost a different species of mule deer. It's like their ears are so <laughs> gigantic, and they have like like donkey bodies, the yeah. noses and the Roman nose. We saw some big bucks down there, and <clears throat> and then I saw some big antlered bucks, but not big bodied, mm-hmm. like right. really big antlered. Sure, how desert mule deer are, are definitely smaller in body size, smaller in weight. I ran a check station in southeastern Arizona, not far from where mm-hmm. you were hunting that for 15 years, and we weighed all white tails and, and mule deer that came through there. And it was pretty unusual to get a field dressed mule deer buck that over 200 pounds. Uh, we pretty saw unusual. a couple that had huge bodies, and I wondered if they're like they they remind me of the Sonoran Mexico bucks that you see in some high ranch magazine mm-hmm. you know some mm-hmm. fancy um you know ranch down in tech in mexico and <clears throat> deer are like humans you got some big bodied ones that's that's what i noticed was uh, and 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 uh when you have a body that's as big as some of these mule deer that we saw and then you have a big set of antlers on it they don't seem as big mm-hmm. as they really mm-hmm. are and uh, when we saw two giant bucks, antler bucks, t- face off, and you saw this other one just dwarf it body size, I was like, wow. I mean, that that put in perspective how big his rack actually was. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were actually in Mexico that we were watching these deer, but they're only 100 yards over. So, <laughs> you know, you know, they're going to, there's no wall there yet. I'd like yeah. them to come over before the wall gets extended right there. <laughs> it comes in there. Uh, there's portions where we ran into the wall um, and then, uh, and then the border wall and then areas where n- no border wall forever. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, people ask what the impact of, of any kind of fence along that border and there's sections now and, and you can't answer that until we see what gaps there's going to be. Like, especially when you're talking about carnivores and some of the smaller animals, just the topography itself is not going to lend itself to a, 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 a boundary without a gap. There's right. gaps all over the place. It just depends how big they are and where they are. And, and I don't know why we can't build them in there purposely and focus some electronic and high tech surveillance on some of these gaps. That Absolutely. Would allow animals. I mean, I, I would like 
someone to have a reasonable conversation about how to how to maintain permeability for wildlife and still do what maybe we need to limit some some ingress but, certainly yep. there's areas where they couldn't cross but they're gonna go a mile down and cross there just if like they gaps. would mm -hmm. just like they would in I don't know, Hell's or in uh, Grand Canyon or something. There's, yeah, well, there's you see pronghorn be... do that too. If there's in an area with network fences, there's a few places where they can duck under, and you see them walk a half mile along the fence, and then they know where these right. little gaps are, and they go under. So let's uh, read one of these comments. So I wrote a comment here on Instagram, and it sparked a, a, a intense conversation. I think I have like eighty uh, comments here on this that are full on book reports. Wow, I never went back and read and so, all of those. Uh, I wrote in here, I'll read my, what I, what sparked this. I said, uh, I just got home from Arizona last night. This annual hunt has been good to me. This was my third year in a row doing this hunt. I think Arizona does a great job of balancing game populations with hunter opportunities. And I really value the work that you guys do. And then I said, my only complaint is that coos deer and mule deer aren't managed separately with the OTC archery tags. I wish Arizona would sell hunters a tag for coos and a separate tag for mule deer and manage them separate, separately. I think the over-the-counter archery tag allocations should be based on the health of each species of deer instead of treating them as a collective when they're so clearly different from one another. But I'm not a biologist, nor do I work at the game agency. So I'll see if I can have a discussion with my good friend and Arizona deer biologist, Jim Deer. So here you are, <laughs> Jim Raffelfinger. And so... Uh, you know, later on people chimed in and there was a lot of the, just the comments just kept coming. Okay. And people had been following the hunt th throughout the couple of weeks we were there. And again, I, I don't really know what's going on necessarily. It's mm -hmm. just anecdotal. Mm -hmm. It's just rumor. It's what people say. And so <laughs> yeah, we never talked about. The yeah. Details. So I want to kind of cl clarify a few things. Mm -hmm. Cause you, you came in and you chimed in and you, you explained how, sort of the game management process works in Arizona. Is it true that you, so the archery over the counter archery tag is any deer. Mm -hmm. It is any deer, any deer, yep. but, and so it, 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 from, if you just look at it from the outside, any you're like deer. any antler deer. Yeah, Cause any deer means something else. Yeah. Yeah. To true. Us. So any, any, antler any antler deer, any buck coos or, or mule deer. And you're allowed one with that tag, either one doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> Then you have your rifle, all your rifle hunts, yeah. and you have harvest through, Many more rifle through your hunts. rifle hunts. Those are managed separately. Mm -hmm. right? So we don't want to give the illusion that, that they're just lumped together everywhere. And Yeah, and that the species aren't managed separately because they are and they have been. And, and there's, as you said, there's, there's a lot of really good reasons why we need to manage those things separately. They're ecologically, they're a lot different. One thing to mention right off the top is if, if you if people think about well, why can't I have a Mueller tag and a whitetail tag, <clears throat> we, it, the bag limit is one deer per year and it has to be one deer per year because in the, in the draw cycle for the general tags, we have 90,000 people apply for a deer tag and we have 45,000 deer tags. So you have a 50% chance of just going hunting to kill one buck in Arizona in the, in the regular draw cycle. So when you've got double the demand for the, for people that want to go deer hunting for the tags, you, you can't, you've got to be careful with your, with the opportunity. You can't let anybody kill two, two you deer. Know, yeah. Uh, any deer. It's not enough to go around. Any deer. Yeah. There's not enough. I mean, we have twice as, we have half of the people that apply that sit home and don't get to go deer hunting. So it wouldn't be fair to let some people. Kill two deer. We did have two deer during the 1980s. In the 1980s, we had populations. We had about two back-to-back -back record winter rainfalls and then two or three back-to-back -back intervening summer monsoon rainfall periods that were near record rainfall periods. And so when, when you get that in the Southwest, you get multi-years of, of rainfall, lots of groceries out there. They all, all the does have twins. The twins survive and grow up. Mm -hmm. After a year, the twins, uh, you know, the, the fawns, uh, are having their own fawns and our population just skyrocketed in the eighties. And we actually had a two bag, two bag limit for deer. So sometimes you hear people talk about how good it was in the 1980s. And now they've, the, the game and fish departments managed them into the ground. Cause it's not like the 1980s. Well, I want to read that. Comment. Yeah. That was such an unusual. So, high. so here's one, uh, by, uh, on Instagram. I appreciate everyone who chimed in, by the way, this is Dave AZ Hunter on Instagram. And he said, uh, Arizona hunting is on the decline. Mule deer are hurting like I have never seen. Areas that held great mule deer 20 years ago have been taken over by coos deer. As for tags and quality, resident 
residents asked for more opportunity versus quality. So that's what Game and Fish gave us. But people don't understand what they ask for, what they asked for. More opportunity does not mean more shots at deer. It means more tags in the field. Equals more pressure, more hunters, more deer killed. Hunting is nothing like it was in the 80s. I'm, uh, I'm used to see, I used to see uh, big deer often, now lucky to get drawn every five to six years. Archery hunts end up competing with guys on every hill, uh, glassing. In, other, in, in another 20 years, even archery t- t- tags will be draw. With YouTube channels galore about hunting areas, few areas will remain, remain secretive. Hunting is becoming a rich man's sport. If you have the, the cash for landowner tags and guide fees, you will enjoy great tags. Yeah, we don't have <clears> any <throat> landowner tags, um, you know, or, or in Arizona. Yeah, in, Ari- in Arizona, we don't. But that, that speaks to the, that high level in the 1980s, which was true. We, we had deer everywhere in the 1980s. And then that was such an unusual high. Yeah, you responded to that. And I also, uh, you know, spoke to different biologists who have told me that you know, mule deer populations were even, even before the eighties were kind of an anomaly just because we had wiped out all the predators. So oh, in the 1950s. Predators. Yeah. We had different conditions like in the fifties. and 60s. We've logged everything. Mm-hmm. So that cleared so much habitat for, for ungulates. You bet. That's and, right. and it was, a it, so, and we had put in some um harvest and and restrictions on hunting so uh, it it was the perfect storm to create a really artificial and strange boom in mule deer populations they were using poisons in some cases for predators so predator populations really were lower in some cases they were doing it all over they were trying to get rid of coyotes wolves some of it was pretty widespread but but the thing that really drove the deer population at that time the, the the lower predator populations contributed, but all that disturbance, like Thanks you said, logging and some overgrazing at the times and, and deer thrive on disturbed habitats and the rejuvenation of disturbed yeah. habitats. So we did have, we had, did have a boom in populations in the past, like in the fifties and sixties. You didn't have also is not sustainable. We can't you, ever go back to that. And in those situations, you didn't have the highways and all mm-hmm. the migration right. paths blocked and, and mm-hmm. you didn't have civilization in, encroachment out there yeah. on the habitat. So a lot of things you just have a, you, it was a recipe for just a, a booming mm-hmm. population of mule deer. And I think, um, once you stop logging so much, once you stop raping and pillaging the countryside, right, right. once you right. let other predators actually live on the landscape, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you're, you you hit a new norm, right? We can't, it, it, we can't look at some of those conditions in the past as our benchmark that we, that we judge everything currently on. And I've heard that said by, even when we uh, talked to the mule deer foundation Mm -hmm. and had them on the podcast a little bit, um, mule deer are, they're actually more stable than is the going, you know, conversation usually that they're on the demise. They're right. They'll disappear. You see that quite a bit that, you know, mule deer need our help because they're, they're declining and they're really stable. There's a couple States. There's probably two or three States where they're, um, where they're declining, um, because it's, I say, when people say, how are, how are mule deer doing? And it's, it's like asking a kindergarten teacher how the class is doing. You've got some kids not doing very well and some kids excelling. And it's the same thing when you talk about 24 Western states and Canadian provinces that have mule deer populations, you know, some are doing well and some aren't, but right. overall as, as just kind of a snapshot of the whole West, they're stable or slightly increasing below, below objectives, below what we'd like, but they're not. They're not disappearing. Right. Um, what do you, what do you think about uh, the comment here regarding um, quality versus opportunity? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's good. We should talk about that because our, our age, there were times in our agency where we had people that were in charge that were really interested in just maximizing opportunity and, and, and setting guidelines that, um, not caring if they were five to 15 bucks per hundred does from mule deer and things like that. Just trying to get as many people out in the field as possible. And, and I always lean more towards the opportunity side, but in the last 10 or 15 years, our agency is not pouring on the tags and, and trying to provide as much rifle opportunity as possible. It, the trend has been the opposite. And if anybody's paying attention, especially to whitetail on social media, it's just I mean, it's almost getting boring how many gigantic whitetail bucks um, they're coming out of, of our mountain range. I don't know how anybody can say that we're, we're like over exploiting our whitetails and you can't see any big bucks. Cause if 
<laughs> just all no, over the place. No one has really said that. This is all in reference to mule deer. Almost yes. every comment on this this is regarding yeah. the mule deer. And yeah. and to me, that's the issue at play. That's why I said, you know, if we if we chased mule deer at all, we were bombarded by hunters. It mm-hmm. was it was a it was exponentially more competition in a mule deer area if we went over here where the, it was there was no mule deer and we just chased coos deer we pretty much had the mm-hmm. range to ourselves. a car yeah. might drive by once but yeah. generally speaking it's all on our own yeah. and but, and that area where <clears throat> you were hunting happens to be a fairly popular area you wouldn't see that spread throughout southeastern arizona um that way but w- one of those areas down there and another thing i should mention too is that we were talking about whether you can manage these uh, independently so southeastern arizona um now if you look at all of the all of the mule deer and white-tailed deer that are harvested 90 percent of those deer are harvested on species specific tags where someone has yeah i wanted you to mention that yeah or, or a mule deer and so when you say 90 percent of the harvest of the harvest is species specific it tells me that you're managing them separately. We are. We're managing them separately. But other than, mostly through the rifle process. Mm-hmm, right. Because yep. that's where the bulk of that harvest comes from. Yep. And so if archery is such a smaller percentage of harvest, arch, archery is like less than 14% of the total harvest in the state comes from archery. So when it's a smaller percent, we can allow hunters more flexibility in, in being able to take Yeah, because they they're want. not going to kill one anyway. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So, well, my, my opinion and our department's kind of um overall view is to not restrict hunters if we don't have to to protect the resource so if only less than 14 percent of the total harvest is coming from archery then maybe we don't need to make the archers choose whitetail or mealer maybe they can go out there and what they see they can they can pursue and i've always personally just wanted to keep uh to, to give hunters as much flexibility not over regulate them and and you have to hunt in this area at this time and only this right. species and I, I don't like over regulating hunters i like to just keep things as as open and give them as many options as possible unless we need to do something to protect the resource and we do have um we do have some things in place that allow us to even manage the archery harvest so one thing that we have that I'm, I'm not sure you've ever heard was that we look in each game management unit, we look at the overall harvest, and if more than 20% of the harvest is coming from archers, then we have some options to change, that restrict the archery season. So we've got the, the late the August-September seasons, and we've got December, and we have January periods. We can remove any one of those portions of the, the hunt and, and reduce the amount of time archers are able to hunt in that in that area mm-hmm. also if we've got a, a a unit where there's plenty of whitetail we don't want to restrict archers during a certain time period if they were just going to hunt whitetails it's fine so we have in at least one unit change that so that you can only you can only hunt whitetails during say the january period in yeah. that unit yeah. so to reduce the the amount of mule deer harvest so we we've only begun to start doing that but we have that option of restricting species even in the archery where it's and or it's any antlered it's crossed my mind because um <clears throat> you know looking at the hunt itself and the experience i had on the hunt I, i'd be curious if you asked guys who hunt every year so so when we were in some of these areas it was real crowded and we were we had a bunch of our stocks blown up by other guys and you read the comments in here and a lot of guys say just in the last two or three years even that when they go out on stocks, now they have to, they get stocks blown by other hunters who don't respect the hunt and, or don't really know they're also chasing the same deer. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's become just kind of a joke. It's just a really frustrating and and tough experience. Uh, My question to that person is, well, you know, would you prefer to have that tag every other year, every third year, Mm -hmm. or would you rather just, deal with the pressure that you have to deal with that that's a really important point my whole career working with game management we will have people if they see a lot of hunters they'll call me up they'll come to public meetings and they say you have too many tags in this unit everybody doesn't think that they're the one that's going to sit home next year if we restrict tags right and so so there's always this idea that i want i want less tags in this unit so i won't see as many people there they're going to be the ones sitting home sometimes. And and if the resource can handle the harvest, then I think hunters on public land, hunters, if the resource can handle that much harvest, hunters just need to be able to deal with other people using public lands with them. 
I, <clears throat> I would prefer myself just dealing with the pressure because I feel like, you know, Ryan and I have talked about this 5% of the archers killed 90% of the mm -hmm. deer. And it's you two are in the five percent. So if we're in the five percent, I'm like, I just want to tag every year. Yeah, and that's and I don't mean to um, to say that that concern of hunter crowding is not legitimate. There are people who would rather hunt every once every three years and have hardly anybody out there with them. I mean, there's all kinds of different right. people that want uh, different experiences, and, and we as an agency with the rifle hunts, we have a few alternative units where we lower the tags a lot lower than, than we could be if we were interested in just opportunity. And, and it's to provide a unit that it's harder to get drawn, but if you really want to go once every three years and have less hunters, a higher buck to doe ratio, more mature bucks, mm -hmm. you've got some units you can apply for and have that experience less frequently. And so Correct. as an agency, right. we, we try to provide that opportunity is there now. Mm -hmm. If you want to, we try to provide a diversity. What is it? The Kaibab is like two, three points to draw right now. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at that. I think yeah. for archery, it's but two points or we three have units, points. You know, that more. you could go every year because it's kind of a, an opportunity unit. And, and you know, you, uh, agencies, what I mean though is that some of these have turned into a draw, mm -hmm. and and oh, now right, the archery, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. the archery has turned into a draw. Now it takes two or three points mm -hmm. to to get the tag. Yeah, and people complain about that. Yeah, um, so we do have we do have some lottery style draw in some of our archery units that were they were just too crowded, too crowded. So we did that. So you can choose that. You, you could choose, choose that, that if you want, and then if you don't get it, you can choose this over the counter thing where you're going to be crowded. Yep. On and that's the name years. of the game as an agency. You want to provide a diversity of options and experiences, and people can choose what they want to do. So Jim, my concern as I was anecdotally just taking in what I saw over the last three years is that the mule deer will suffer, uh, unduly suffer. Uh, and I don't know if this is statistically accurate or not, but it seemed to me that everybody was trying to kill the mule deer and they weren't chasing the coos deer. And yeah. so I see these mule deer just getting hit. They, they eat and they eat and then they get bumped by somebody who blows a stock. They go over here, another guy bumps them and then another guy bumps them. They get bumped like mm -hmm. every day, every hour. Mouths are hanging out. It's hot. They're still trying to run a little bit here toward the end. And I'm like, man, is this too much? Or, or Yeah, I, I don't think it's that situation throughout a, a majority of deer range. I think everyone who made a comment, you they make it sound like it's yeah. like that. Yeah, we did, we actually did a study. It was white tails. But I see when people talk about deer getting bumped constantly and, and that stressing them out, I think in reality, if you really look at all of the deer that are in the population, if you could actually mm -hmm. see all the deer, I think it's a small percentage of them that really get repeatedly bumped to the point where they're really moving a lot. And someone that in our department did their master's degree, having radio collared white tails, and they purposely went in with telemetry equipment and bumped them during the rut, bumped them and bumped them and bumped them until they couldn't find them anymore. They just went too far for the telemetry and they did that repeatedly. And then they measured the reproductive rates and they measured the rutting of that population. And there was no effect of, of getting repeatedly well, that's, harassed like that. During that's what I wondered. Season. Is it too much harassment? Because I actually don't think the harvest rate's going to go up that much. You know, some of these guys are like mule deer's on the decline. It's nothing like it used to be. And I'm like, when we drove out of there and we stopped at the checkpoint, they're like, did you kill a deer? Yeah. I said, yeah. <laughs> they said, no way. Really? <laughs> we've asked hundreds of people. We've never seen, we've never actually talked yeah. to a guy who killed a deer. Mm -hmm. Same thing at the gas station. I've had station. that response. I've had, oh, really? You do have a deer. Can I see it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so yeah. yeah. I've been delayed at the border patrol check station with a deer before because they wanted to same with, see it. Same but, thing with Ryan. And so uh, it tells me that even though there's a lot of dudes out there, that your harvest rate is still extremely low. Mm -hmm. I think people have a perception that deer are, are just bumped and harassed a lot. And in reality, every individual deer out there, it's a very small percentage of them that might get bumped repeatedly in a day. So mm -hmm. I think that's not so much of an issue. And then you said before that you were worried that the, the deer population, that mule deer may suffer. But we have those other things in place where we can limit harvest of mule deer. We can, we can close certain seasons. So the mule deer biologically aren't going to suffer, but the, the hunters may see less opportunity with more and more people going down there. We'll manage always so that the deer population not hurt, but, but there will be changes. There will be changes to, um, some of the harvest structures. If uh, more than 20% of the harvest comes from archery. See what I was thinking was along the lines of, um, the way that I saw to, to manage them separately would be two separate tags. Mm -hmm. And 
And it would be nice if it, if you were able to buy two separate tags for archery, but, and in fact, I, I like the idea of buying two separate tags, but then you can only fill one, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. just like you do for, I can get a draw tag in Arizona and yep. the over the counter tag. I yep. just still only allowed one deer. Right. Yep. So I do, I do like but if, that. But if someone had a white tail and a mule deer tag in their pocket, it, would it change anything? Ryan would still go down and kill that big mule deer. But here's what I think. <laughs> You're right. But, but you I hate it. his guts. But uh, <laughs> no, no. What what I think is this: um, <clears throat> the mule, the coos deer are such a, a giant resource. To me, you can just you can't get enough people to go hunt those things. Mm-hmm. And they're Boone and Crockett giant. They're just everywhere. They're awesome. Like I said, a challenge. I'm I'm addicted to the coos deer. I but here's what how where I would approach it. I, where, what I thought Arizona might do is in some of these hunts where there's just so much archery mule deer pressure, do unlimited goose deer mm-hmm. and then limit the then mule limit deer the mule deer, deer. unit. <clears throat> so maybe I'll so. only get a mule deer tag every other year, mm-hmm. and or every third year. But I can always still go hunt coos, and that will drive people to hunt coos deer mm-hmm. if they want to get out and they want to hunt. Because right now, Jim, I think. Most of the people we talk to, I would say seven out of ten, they're not they're not even going to bother with the coos deer. They're not. Well, mule deer a lot easier. Yep. So what you're talking about could be done, but but that means that's just a, a lot more restriction on the hunter. Instead of getting a tag and it being good for almost anywhere in Arizona except for those mm-hmm. permit tags, almost anywhere in Arizona for either species, now you're going to have to limit to a certain game management unit and a certain species. Yeah, and if we don't, I could see so it. that's a big restriction for. A lot I of hate hunters. that idea because it's all about opportunity too, but I do see how you can you can be as liberal as you want with the coos deer you side, mm-hmm. and Jim, I've gone in there three years in a row for coos deer, and there's it's an adventure, right? Yeah. And so you're still giving everyone in the state and outside the state that opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's just there's the supply and the demand for the mule deer archery tag just seems so high that that it might fall into that draw category at some point. Some kind of we've got a lot of options between here and draw, like that table I was talking oh, about, where yeah. we just shut off mule deer for certain seasons in those units. So that's the structure we have now. And sometimes, like you're suggesting, a different system. Sometimes people suggest a different way to do things, and it's not wrong. It's yeah. just a different way, and we're doing it this way now. And I, the way that you're advantage. doing it, if I understand it correctly, what you're saying is, you know, you don't want to regulate if you don't have to. Keep it as unregulated as possible. And if the mule deer population shows a decline or if it does struggle, then you can shut off the mule deer in a certain area. For, for part of the for, season, for, we could say no mule deer for the, the August and September seasons. And then if it continues that there's just a lot of harvest uh, on mm-hmm. mule deer in that unit by archers, then we can say with well, the end the last part of December um, is whitetail only. And then if that continues, um, we, could, we can shut off archery for all mule deer. So that right there isn't really impacting. That's, in, that's, that's managing for the greatest opportunity, but not necessarily the, the most, um, the best hunt experience for hunters in one sense, right, because, right. because what you're saying is, okay, we really want to give everyone an opportunity here. Everyone. That means you're going to have a lot of people trying to get, you know, there's going to be pressure. There's going to be mm-hmm. more people crowd in the area, but the upside is you can go wherever you want and you can hunt as much as you want. I like that myself. I prefer that. I'll, I'll deal with the obstacles in my way. Give me the opportunity. But there's a lot of guys who, who would prefer, rather than managing it, you know, based on the population, how well that herd is doing only, mm-hmm. they'd like to see you manage it for a higher quality hunt. Sure, right. And, and some of those uh, rifle hunts that I call alternative unit hunts, we one of the guidelines is number of uh, number of hunters per square mile. So, I mean, that's right. part of the hunt recommendation is hunter densities because we're that's part of what we're managing for, not just biology, but the experience. The too. experience. So we right. do that, that makes the tag that more valuable mm-hmm. in many ways. And but right then, when you go that route, you, there's also those opportunities both in Arizona and out of Arizona. To me, mm-hmm. you know, if I can do the Arizona tag over the counter and just deal with the pressure. And then I can put in for a kayabab or a draw tag mm-hmm. of some kind where I can have that experience where there's fewer hunters and it's a higher quality, mm-hmm. like less, less competition, I suppose, yeah. from other hunters. Then I can go and do that, but I can always just do 
the my my fallback, which mm-hmm. is any deer. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, I yeah. think there's probably nobody that hasn't felt like, boy, I wish there was less people out here with me, but it's public lands and it's a resource. And when you, when you poll the general public and state after state has done this year after year for long periods of time, you poll the, the general hunting public and you, and you say, what are you interested in? And, and it always comes out where people, they just want to tag. They want the opportunity to get out there with family and friends and mm-hmm. go deer hunting that year. They don't want to have to sit home. And then secondly, they'd like to be able to see a good number of deer. And thirdly, they'd like to see a decent buck. And fourthly, they'd like to kill a decent buck. But it goes in that order. They People just really, most people just really want to tag. And there's a subset that don't agree with that. There's a subset yeah. that they want to go, they want a really quality experience and they don't care if it's every four years or not. I feel like if that's the the, the smaller population, mm-hmm. because it's, you, you have to sacrifice somewhere. So, you know, mm-hmm. you, you either have to have the high opportunity, high a high, you know, a lot of a more crowded hunt mm-hmm. or a very low opportunity. You get the hunt to yourself. Yep. And, and we, uh, we, we try to do all of that, but in a certain unit, you have to choose mm-hmm. the, the Utah biologist, Justin Shannon always makes a joke that one time they pulled their public and they said, listen, you have to choose. Do you want bigger bucks or do you want more bucks, more opportunity? And everybody answered that they wanted more opportunity to shoot bigger bucks. <laughs> and that's what it is. The public wants That's both. exactly what I was about to the say. Public I want more opportunity for bigger yeah, bucks. Yeah. So yeah. it doesn't work. It's, that it's like, it's yeah, it doesn't work. Right. Right. Um, one thing I've experienced being down there is I did run into people and I've said this throughout the year, especially spending time with Ryan Lampers. It is not necessarily where you hunt. It's how you hunt. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. You know, not everybody has the time to develop the skills or to put in the archery time that, that maybe Ryan does or just the time in the field to, to understand deer and hunt them. I, I've watched him and others that are, that are good hunters. It doesn't matter where you put them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're don't seem to, I know it. Yeah. And so when I get some comments from people that say, you know, the hunting has just been ruined, mm-hmm. um, we find giant coos deer, we found giant mule deer, and we killed both. Mm-hmm. And they were, yes, we ran into people. Some of our stocks got blown, and then some of them didn't. Yeah. And that's all that matters. Here's I the mean, deal, though. Well, even if you're mule deer hunting, which is just more accessible and more open, if you look on a map and you look at the road system in that area on that map, mm-hmm. and you look for some little isolated hills that are just a half mile from a road, Dude, and you get out, you walk a half yeah. mile to a hilltop. It's a whole different deal. Nobody in Arizona leaves a road. I know. Nobody mm-hmm. leaves a road. And that's what people complain like there was campers all along the road. I mean, there was trucks driving up and down the road. Of deer Glassing hunters. from the road. Yeah. No. But if you just look on a map and find a big blank spot and get out there and you got to get on hills so you can glass. It's, and that's what we do all the time. My family is just get out away from there. That was a discussion I had with people online. I haven't, see I haven't runners. hardly left a road, Jim. I know we I left know, like know. we, we back, we didn't back back in, but we, we hiked into a couple of spots and we had some killer, uh, hunting. Mm-hmm. We didn't see a soul. Yeah. We and didn't see a soul. You overlook a big wash with a lot of cover where a lot of those big bucks hang out for, to get uh, in the shade and just for, or even just cover. a slope that's thick and mm-hmm. there's really no way to get to that patch of yeah. open country unless you bushwhack it. It's not even far. It's mm-hmm. just, yeah, it's, it's just not thick. Far. It's not far. And, uh, and we had it all to ourselves. Mm-hmm. So there's no question to me, like it, it, there's still there's people are complaining about, you know, uh, being crowded on that hill, mm-hmm. but that's because there's four cars parked up there. Yeah. You know, if you even park here and hike to that hill, you have it all to yourself. Right. And when you're on those hills, you'll see if there's a lot of hunters in the area, you'll see people road hunting, you'll people driving around, you'll see people other areas, but if you Deer are used to that. If you, how many times you've been glassing a deer and then a truck comes by and the deer either doesn't pay attention or, or just steps behind a bush for a while? They're they're pretty resilient to to road traffic, and mm-hmm. so you get off the road. When people complain that there's hunters all over in their area, I guarantee you they weren't more than a half a mile from a road. Yeah, because not that many people go a half a mile from a road. I wish more people were interested in in the coos deer, the archery hunting of the coos mm-hmm. deer. But I understand it's it's hard. It is, yeah. Even some of the the whitetail aficionado. I've always been a mule deer fan, so the whitetail aficionados used to tell me, "When are you going to take the training wheels off and hunt whitetails?" 
Yeah. They, they considered mule deer training wheels. But I love mule deer. They're beautiful. They are. And when you see a buck like what Ryan shoots, and it's just this chocolate horned, massive, heavy rack that's like huge. It's like, and then you shoot a little coos deer. <laughs> You're like, you do feel a little, you, you, we're all taken aback by, by bone mass. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I came to Arizona stag, from elk, managing whatever. a trophy. I managed a trophy whitetail ranch in South Texas mm. where the average, it was 150 Boone and Crockett was the average score of about 20 bucks that we would kill. And I was used to seeing these just iconic, massive South Texas whitetails. And then I came and became a biologist here. Yeah. And that's why I gravitated to mule deer. <laughs> the coos deer here are uh, amazing though. And they're pretty. They're, they're just, they're way different. You can sure tell when you just look at their face. <clears throat> so this year I saw probably four or five bucks that had bodies. Because I see everything that we see um, every day. We see a Boone and Crockett class um, yeah. coos deer. And you don't in November, by the way. If you have a, a rifle tag in October, mm-hmm. November, you don't see those big bucks walking around. But they're there. We saw some with eye guards that were peeking above the main beams <laughs> that had just mass and multiple points, just trash, stickers mm-hmm. and junk off the sides. and And you see a... And it's funny because just because they had a rack like that didn't mean they had a body to match it. Mm-hmm. But there were a few coos deer bucks we came across this year that just looked like Saskatchewan whitetail through the spot <laughs> spotter, just necks and shoulders. And yeah. I didn't see very many. They're so dainty looking. Mm-hmm. There's a few though that I saw that just look like muscular. They're just another body class. Mm-hmm. Same with mm-hmm. the mule deer I was talking about. Yep. And, um, I got a minute. I got excited on a couple of those it's just because just right. they're so you just, clearly You're used to seeing dominant. these little kind of graceful deer, and then you see something with, that's got some just muscle Just huge, and I wonder how old that deer is to mm-hmm. look that way, or is it more a genetic factor? I don't think it's – I think the older bucks are – they look blocky like that, but I, I think you still get some younger bucks that were able to just get a lot of good food and bulk mm-hmm. up and get big. The ones we saw looked old in the face mm-hmm. that were big like that. You can tell. Mm-hmm. There's characteristics. You can tell. And the other thing was they just have mass in the antlers mm-hmm. that some of the other ones don't. Mm-hmm. seems like a coos deer doesn't get much more in tine length that once it hits a certain spot, it just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Yeah. <laughs> and antlers in general, too, the, as they get past their peak of antler growth, like five to seven years old is the mm-hmm. peak of antler growth, what you always get is shorter, stubbier. You always get more mass, mm-hmm. but the tines do get shorter as they get yeah. older. So some of these old bucks, some of it's just they're probably past their peak. Yeah. And you don't see as many non-typicals in cow's whitetail for some reason. Even look in the record books and the percentage we saw of a lot. the typical. Did you really? Yeah. Oh. yeah, we saw a lot. But good luck killing them. I mean, that's like the next challenge. I love it. but So reassure me on the mule deer thing. Because the big reason that I was thinking, man, you should manage these separately. Maybe maybe push the, you know, as many coos deer tags as you want to put out there, that's fine. But maybe, maybe restrict the number of mule deer harvested because i was thinking the tag allocations are so high that that harvest rate's too high but yeah biologically it's not too high it's a small percentage of the of the total harvest and so you can i mean there's various ways you can limit the number of people pursuing pursuing mule deer both to reduce the harvest and to reduce the hunter crowding um and the system we have is to close off mule deer mm-hmm. um, for certain seasons or just and, and you can keep white tail open um in that respect and and so what you're talking about is a different system, but your system requires more restriction and less flexibility to the hunter. Yeah. So that's probably why we're not there now. Okay. So tell me this. Uh, we ran into a lot of big mule deer. There wasn't a shortage of them. We didn't see very many other deer. They mm-hmm. were only big. They were big or we didn't see them. What's that about? I'm not sure. It could have just been happenstance like it is Time sometimes. Time of year, rut. It could be mature bucks being more secretive during the November season than the younger dumb ones getting whacked. And so you're at the end of the whole year's hunting season. When yeah. you're, you're looking at the buck population after we've had hundreds and hundreds of, I'm telling of you, buck hunters in there. Jim, we saw some, Arizona has some stud deer. <laughs> and they were everywhere on this public land over the counter hunt. Mm-hmm. But they were broken. Broken to pieces. So what does that tell you if if... If you have a bunch of bucks that are super mature and every one of them has broken tines, um, and it is late in the season. Yeah. But does that mean there's a lot of 
big bucks? It can be a nutritional year. I, I would hesitate to say that we have so many mature bucks there. They're all breaking their tines. We had main beans busted off, back forks busted. <laughs> like these deer, and there was, I think, there was like 40, 50 does with one buck. I mean, these. Yeah, I see, I think a lot of that was just random chance because I did for 20, 22, 23 years, I did helicopter surveys after all of the, at, in January, same time of year. Mm -hmm. And I, there's just not a high percentage of broken antlers. So. That's why I think it might have just been chance with some of the bucks you saw okay. in that area. Yeah, because hundreds and hundreds of, of bucks seen throughout all of southeastern Arizona. Because we covered some ground that. like hours apart from one yeah. area to another area, mm -hmm. and we were still seeing that's odd big bucks. I will say but they weren't really broken um, as much as they were in that one area, but the other areas still there. They were bro bro they were broken mm -hmm. bucks, but but. Uh, I just haven't noticed that. Yeah. You know, with surveys, with a big, big sample size flying around. It seemed to me like there's some competition going on there then. Yeah, no you doubt. Know? Uh, and, and what we saw were mature. So they're obviously escaping death throughout right. the rifle seasons, mm -hmm. throughout the bow seasons, throughout, because these are all bucks that any guy with a rifle would take. Right. And, and keep in mind for over two decades as the regional biologist, I fielded constant calls about we we glassed for five days and we saw well we saw with does all we saw with does and mm -hmm. fawns and two mm -hmm. spikes so I fielded those calls constantly and I would it, it's hard for me to to make that hunter feel better because after the hunts in January I'm flying all of those surveys and all yeah. those units after the hunt and we see tons of mature bucks yeah and so when a hunter calls me and says that we've we've over harvested the deer in that population because he only saw does and fawns for five days it doesn't mean anything it really does. that's why i'm asking yeah, you because say. anecdotally even when we were there uh ryan the only buck he saw and the only one he was the one he killed hmm. on that day you know when he got in there mm -hmm. and then nothing yeah you know it just yeah. happened to find one so then we went back days later and we were we saw um some great bucks two days in a row mule deer and then we didn't see any bucks for like four days mm -hmm. None. even like i was talking about me and my family going to the same hill for not every year but every few years for 20 years and sometimes we'll see in a morning we'll see three or four bucks in in like the november mm -hmm. season yeah when you don't when you, they're not rutting we'll see three or four bucks and then we could go in there the next year and spend three days and not see a buck it's yeah. a lot of it's just random chance. No, hunters don't understand that. But that's some where it's it's, some of that's timing that you can invest. That's why R Ryan and I like to take 10 days. Mm -hmm. If it, it's, especially on an archer hunt, we feel like if we have 10 days, seven is not enough. 14 is a lot, but if you can hit that magic spot of 10 days, um, a lot of times you're, you might go four days and not see a single thing, mm -hmm. see something for two days. Mm -hmm. not see anything for three days, see something for three days, you yeah. know, you do you, gives you these options, you no know, doubt. Yeah. um, and that's the, that's the truth of it there. I felt like there were people complaining about not seeing any deer and we're like, um, we saw a lot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were also able to put in more time than some the people. 5%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so the, you're telling me though that the deer population is down there. They're not getting crushed by these archery hunts. Right no. Now. Another thing I, I should mention too is I looked at the last five years of whitetail and mule deer um, permits, and, and our permits have come like we we're talking about the highs in the 80s mm -hmm. and the mule deer population declined. We we didn't keep the permit levels up as the mule deer population declined and the whitetail population from the highs in the 80s. Every year we assess the population. We apply actual buck to doe ratios, fawn to doe ratios, and hunt success that we gather that year, we apply it to our guidelines, and we try to stay within guidelines for buck to doe ratios, mm -hmm. and, fawn to, and we adjust the permits every year. And so if you look at a graph of that, you see our permits coming down along with like hunt success and other indicators of how many deer there are out there. So we reduce permits, and then when the deer population has been coming up for 15 years or so, recovering from that, we're always a little slower to add permits because we want to err on the, sure. the side of caution. Mm -hmm. And in the local wildlife managers are always very protective of their deer herds because it's 
them signing, it's them writing their hunt recommendation. And, and if they make a mistake, it's, you know, the hunters are going to complain to them because it's their population. So they're very conservative and, and reluctant to add permits back in until they're really confident and have some really good strong signs that populations increase. So for the statewide, for the last four years, for the last five years, we've decreased permits by 4%. And so the last five years, we've decreased permits by 4%. And in that time, harvest has increased 35 to 40% for whitetail and mule deer. So basically, same number of permits, 4% less, but you could kind of consider that same number of permits. Mm-hmm. Harvest has increased How much? Five to 40%. On uh, archery? In, in the, no, statewide, oh, all statewide. harvest. Okay. Yep. So that's an, 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 actually not archery, just general rifle. Because that's where we have the permits. Okay. Okay. So that's that's a pretty strong indication that these deer populations are coming up in the last five years because we've kept the the uh, number of people the same, and and they've harvested a lot more deer, which means there's more deer out there than there was. Now I had a lot of people write in that said that they think you're wrong because you don't do mandatory harvest. Right. Uh, yeah. Reporting. It's vol- after the hunt. There's a post hunt questionnaire we send out that's voluntary, and through the years the the return rate has decreased on that and so we've had a lot of discussions for a lot of years about making that mandatory the problem is it's kind of the same deal okay you're going to make it mandatory making it mandatory means there's a penalty what's the penalty you can't go deer hunting next year that seems kind of draconian i don't know if we want to get to get to that point you find them a certain amount our whole agency is trying to get more people out in the field to enjoy the outdoors and, mm-hmm. and promote hunting and get some new hunters in and r- recruitment retention reactivation kind of activities are, are Do we you really want to penalize them are you concerned that the harvest rates have gone up on archery no oh well this was a rifle mm-hmm. that was rifle where the permits are the same and, and harvest is right. going up and so we're not, we Even, have those, we, we can manage the rifle permits with permits and then we can manage the archery with that system. We have uh, overall harvest, mm-hmm. you know, we can increase it and decrease it. So how do you determine if you don't have an accurate reporting mechanism mm-hmm. from hunters, you know, how, how are you kind of assessing populations? Well, we feel for the harvest information, the survey information comes from us surveying helicopters. That's direct information. Okay. Then the other half of it's harvest information. And that comes from the, that post hunt questionnaire. And I think we're down to maybe 22% return rate. But when you do the statistics on that and you look at what the error rate is, 22%, we felt we've been between 20 and 40% in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. And we felt that that was good, solid information. We felt that the harvest information we get is is statistically valid to use and strong enough to use it's not like we don't know what's going on out there you know they they predict presidential elections with like two percent of the votes in so with with a big enough sample size you can use statistics to see uh, what your your error rate is yeah your right interval and, and so we look at that confidence we can have yeah when i was doing uh it governance compliance work for years all my audits were statistics right mm-hmm. you just extrapolated it once you had a certain uh, sample size you could pretty much take to the bank that you had an error rate of a certain percentage mm-hmm. when you found so we've problems always had a game our game branch that deals with uh, at the state level we've always had a statistician in the game branch mm-hmm. biometrician statistician yep. and they do yep. that yeah that's pretty accurate i mean it, it is now you know if you get down to like 20 percent there's some units Mm-hmm. that we just don't have the numbers the sample size isn't big enough we don't have confidence in that number but we're looking at what what areas we can take to the bank we have confidence yeah. in and what areas that we we might just kind of ignore that number for that year because the sample size wasn't big enough and then the helicopter so, surveys those really do help you kind of assess what's mm-hmm. going on do you yep. just actually go out and count bucks and no, it's, a, it's all deer we have with the helicopter because that rugged country, you can't, like, you can't cover the whole unit for mm-hmm. one. E- helicopter, um, it's about $1,000 an hour to run a helicopter survey. Yeah. And so, so we have survey blocks, and we go in and we survey with a helicopter that block 100%. And when we're surveying, we're counting number of bucks, number of does, number of fawns. And with that, we can get number of fawns per does. And that's a measure of the recruitment into the population. We can get bucks per doze, which is interesting. You know, how's our buck population doing? We also will record every buck we see, we'll record whether it's a spike two point or three point or three, three plus. And, you know, obviously it's not an age, but it's a, it's an index to the age structure of the population. Right. So you get back and you look, okay, we saw 50 bucks on that survey 
and 60% of them were three-point or better. That tells you something. Yeah, it does. There's not a bunch of spikes and two points out there. Yeah. And so that gives us kind of a measure. And then we look at the number of deer per hour of helicopter flown. There's an index to deer abundance that's out there. Number of deer you, total deer you count per hour flown. Yeah. And then we can do some, some kind of mark. It's called simultaneous double count. We can do some mark recapture. We can kind of calculate. We can, we can estimate densities with the calculation. So basically you're saying on the archery side, you, you do manage each species individually during the rifle seasons where these, they have these high, uh, success, mm -hmm. high harvest hunts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just kind of exactly you issue this much, you're getting to have this many yeah, killed. 20, usually like 25% of the hunters will be successful in a, in an October, November hunt and half the hunters in December, white tail hunters will be successful. So you have a, you have a pretty good indication of that. So then when it comes to the archery, the archery tag that's just over the counter, any deer will do that harvest rate is so low mm -hmm. really right. that you don't have right. to, you don't, you're not yeah. too concerned about it. Even if right. you keep issuing tags and keep issuing tags, we monitor that. So we could make adjustments, but 20 years ago, the archery success rate, this is interesting was six to 7% 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it was about 10%. And last year it was 12%. And if you track the advances in archery equipment mm -hmm. and what people are doing now compared to 20 years ago, we're, we're seeing we're seeing the effect of just being effective out to 70 yards. Where when I bow hunted with my big aluminum arrows and shoot a rainbow sure. rainbow trajectory at 20, at 30 yards. My my question though is with that reach, hunters have the there's like we had a guy that came in on a stock we were on and took a 120 yard shot at a mule deer and missed it. Wow. And he just dialed and let her go. And wow. it's disgusting. I can't imagine and, that. And he, uh, he, he's, not, he's not good enough to make that shot. Mm -hmm. It's just a Hail Mary. That, you're always going to run into that to a certain degree. But I think most hunters have, have a good set of ethics on them. I hope so. And yeah, Stay and, within their limitations. And they know what they can do. I'd say, it's hard to say mm -hmm. how many are like that. You'd like everyone to respect the yeah. animal and respect the hunt you know but that was that was sad it's the same issue with rifle hunters too buying a turret scope and and having a little chart what their trajectory is and then thinking that they can shoot at a thousand yards yep and the gun might be capable of it but they're not yeah and and that's the thing there are there are guys that 70 yards is nothing mm -hmm. um uh, you know 85 90 yards gets to be for some people a very doable, a very high odd shot, but man, I, it's amazing for me back in my bow hunting days, it was out of a tree stand at seven yards, 13 <laughs> yards <laughs> in the East, Eastern yeah. whitetail stuff. Well, I want to read this, what you said a little bit here, just to summarize our discussion here. You said the data shows Arizona mule deer populations are up considerably in the last 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Since um, because as I mentioned there, People don't realize 20 years ago was 2000, the year mm -hmm. 2000. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. But here it is uh, 20 years later, and they've been on the increase. Mm -hmm. yep. So mule deer populations are are improving. I got to tell you, with all the mule deer hunting I did this year, because Lampers is a mule deer, deer nut, uh, and I've seen more of it, and I'm, I'll do more of it this year, there's a lot of killer mule deer hunting opportunities across the West. Mm -hmm. You just have to be willing to get out and work hard, yeah. but it's there. It's there. Uh, you said my own hunting experience and other hunters I talked to have agreed with the actual data on that. So the eighties were an all time unusual high in deer populations. And we can't consider that our baseline to judge current management. We had several years of record rainfall and other things we talked about. Mm -hmm. So um, using the eighties as a benchmark is a bad idea yeah. because you'll it, never be happy. You'll never. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not, a, a, I think a true reflection of what, the, what pre let's say, you know, pre colonization levels of mule deer. No, probably pre colonization. They had periodically these periods of, of abundant Highs rainfall for a couple of years with high populations and then droughts for a couple of years with but, low populations. You know, they're dealing with yeah. fire maybe to clear some landscape, mm -hmm. but they didn't have logging at the levels yeah. that we, we right. came in and you right. just you you do any clear cut in Oregon and your blacktail population shoots through the roof. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. Uh yep. you get rid of all that and your your population tanks. Mm-hmm. And to try to 
yeah, you know, base it on old numbers where we used to log a lot more than we do today. Yeah, with we have had some fires though. Oh yeah, right. That's going to open and, up some booming populations in mm-hmm. California and Idaho and some other right. areas. Yeah, in the down the road, west. down the Beetle road, infestations and yeah. fires have really created a boom for. Um, for some of these whitetail populations, I tracked the data in one right by Tucson, one unit, and we had two big fires back in about 06 and 05, and that whitetail population just went up and up, and we poured on more and more tags, and even though we added more and more tags and their rifle tags in there, the buck-to-doe ratio and the hunt success was still above guidelines, and yeah. still more resource, and, and it got to the point in that case where we stopped because there's just so many hunters. It was a hunter crowding issue. Even though biologically we could kill more deer out of there, we just kind of stopped at a level and said, I don't know if we can have more hunters in that. <laughs> right. Yet. So you say uh, archery, the har- archery harvest is so minimal basically that it's not hurting the mule deer population and rifle tags are not being decreased and not, you're not causing a decrease to the rifle right. opportunities because the archery is killing them all right yeah and that would be a concern you wouldn't want archers unlimited over the tag killing more and more and more and more meal deer and then have us saying well the only way we can adjust is by penalizing the rifle hunters and decreasing that that wouldn't be fair and that's why we have that that benchmark where over 20 percent of the harvest comes from archery then we start limiting archers rather than yeah. just taking it all out of the rifle the trend in harvest pressure in arizona has been very much in the direction of mature animals and not opportunity since 2005, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, like I said before, there's been a time in the past where that would be a legitimate criticism is that we were just pouring on the tags trying to squeeze as much opportunity as possible, but that has not been the case in the last at least 15 years. You said, I recently analyzed all the survey and harvest data for elk and deer from our alternative units, and we were exceeding even the conservative guidelines in those units. Yeah, I was surprised. I, I I put together just where we were at compared to guidelines and regular units and, and the alternative units, which are um, for mature deer and, mm-hmm. and better hunter opportunities. Arizona hunter Strip. Experience. Yeah, and, and around the state, too. We have some of the units around the state, southern Arizona, western. Yeah. And um, I was really pleasantly surprised that our populations are within or above those guidelines still. I mean, we're doing we're doing really well. We may not do a very good job at telling that story, but... Your populations, there's nothing wrong with where they're at with our guidelines. Uh, you said, I don't understand how perceptions can be so different from what the data actually shows. Yeah. H, H structures in the standard management units are very good, as you can see during the rut when they're out and active. Yeah, that was common as a, as a regional biologist dealing with game management. I, I would field calls from time to time with people that had these opinions that just completely conflicted with what I thought was reality, what the data showed and my personal experience being out there, I talked to hunters and they say, I'm seeing a lot more deer out there now compared to 10 years ago. And we are too. Me and my family is too. Well, Lampers and I were joking about this. We're like, we ran into people who said it sucked. It wasn't very good. They had, it, it used to be better. And we, we looked at each other after that person left. We're like, dude, if this is bad, <laughs> if this is bad. <laughs> They were, they were, they, they were spoiled. Yeah. Like, uh, I felt that way about a lot of hunts where, where hunters come up and they say, this is just a terrible hunt. And I'm, I'm looking around going, this was awesome. Mm-hmm. This was incredible. I don't it's know perception. what your expectations were yeah, or what your personal experience. I, I have been in a place where I've gone elk hunting like five days in a row and the other dudes in camp will see de- elk every day and be into them. And I will not see any mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and then by, or vice versa. And so I've learned over time that just because you didn't see it or you yep. didn't get into elk doesn't mean they weren't going nuts somewhere mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. real close. There's you just a lot of that it. just that chance. Ships in the night that just mm-hmm. pass each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people can really quickly build perceptions on how that deer population is doing from three or four days in the field. And I know, you know from experience it's not fair to do that. Well, that's why I like data. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. why I like data because – You know, you can have some kind of anecdotal experience out there. Anyone can just look at a few variables that they have in front of them and have a personal experience. Mm -hmm. But that's different than, you know, actually going out there. Yep. And that's why we survey them after all of the hunts are done. We're surveying them in in mid-January. And so we're managing that population based on the lowest point in buck availability and buck age structure and everything when all the bucks have been removed for that year. So I got some comments from 
Um, my friend John Stallone, he brought up some things and then other guys chimed in. So I'm just going to read a couple of those things as well. Uh, John said, I wish Arizona Game and Fish would make it limited tag numbers for out-of-state guys. First come, first serve. Maybe like a quota or something like some states like Idaho does. I, I don't know. But limiting tags for non-res- non-residents. Um, I also wish they would make a mandatory check-in or reporting because the deer herd, especially the mule deer, have been on a steady decline. They can't continue to rely on the fact that more hunters usually means lower success rate. I say this knowing it will hurt my guiding business to have less opportunity, but it's getting ridiculous how popular this hunt has become and the management hasn't changed. If we want this to be a great hunt for years to come, changes need to be made. So one of the things I feel like state agencies are always dealing with, game agencies, is you charge non-residents Every state does it. Some mm-hmm. are worse. Ridiculous mm-hmm. fees compared to residents. Right. I don't know if they're ridiculous, but higher. I, I hate it. <laughs> I, I, and some, the reason the reason I, f- I find it somewhat antithesis to the hunting community in some ways is because, see, the public land is federally managed mm-hmm. or federally mm-hmm. owned. Yeah. Everybody, it's as much mine as yours, the land in Arizona. That's that's federally federal public land. Mm-hmm. But the animals are owned by the state. Yeah, owned, owned by everybody, but managed by the state. Managed by the state. Mm-hmm. And so when you have a non-resident from New York that's like, you want me to protect public lands in Arizona, but Arizona won't let me hunt the animals? <laughs> yeah. Or they want to gouge me six times the price or ten times the price they charge a resident? They're like, screw you, go to hell. <laughs> and so I think that, and I think there's some, I, I just wonder sometimes if that cost was shared more evenly between the resident and non-resident like everybody would have to do it though i just paid 300 dollars to go over to texas but and, and kill some deer exactly some venison in the freezer but it, it turnabout's fair play when you leave your state and go to a different well, one yeah i remember a public meeting once where everybody was saying you need to jack up the price on they're all resident hunters of course at a local public meeting mm-hmm. you need to jack up that price on non-residents you need to charge them a lot more than we than you charge now and and the the chief of the game branch said can I see a show of hands of anybody that's ever hunted out of state? All the hands went up. So everybody's non-resident hunters, you know, mm-hmm. everybody that's complaining about gouging the non-residents are non-residents themselves. Right. Um, other places. At when they go other places. So the thing that I come across is I actually, in some ways prefer that non-residents pay a lot more because the uh, you guys need money <laughs> well state true. agencies need money they true. need money to be solvent so they can do the jobs and the work that they need to be done if i'm mm-hmm. paying 500 bucks for deer license javelina tag and everything to go to arizona and a resident pays 50 for the same set of gear it's like you're gonna yeah. end up maybe ensuring you have a tag allocation for us non-residents because there's a big revenue stream there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the residents bitch, if you raise the price just a tiny bit, but the, the, but, but you actually can't give as many tags out necessarily mm-hmm. sometimes to residents cause you need the non-resident money. Yeah. And I, I don't, that's always in the mix. Um, looking at the combination of resident and non-residents, I mean, the, the, the account the people that deal with the money are considering all of that. They're always considering the mix of licenses we have and what the cost is on those licenses and, and making sure that a conservation agency has enough funds to do what they need. We do research. We do all the survey. We talked about helicopters being a thousand dollars an hour, uh, law enforcement people need trucks. So you need, you need money. So you can't say that agencies don't think about money and make sure that they have enough money for conservation. But sometimes that that's just uh, exaggerated where people think all we are is just a money-making um, organization and, and trying to gouge everybody. It's interesting, the, the disparity in resident and non-resident licenses and how that um, has, has evolved through time. But when, when we hold public meetings and we talk to resident hunters, they all pretty universally want a lot higher prices for non-resident hunters so that they have more opportunity within the state. Yeah. Um, so as an agency, you're managing the, the wildlife in that state um, for the, for the people of the state. But I understand the argument about public land and that they're living on public land. The habitat in large part is, uh, is public land there. But I don't know that's a system that state agencies have had is higher, higher non-resident licenses. And there's some of them, some agencies that, it, that non-resident fee that they get is a big part of their budget. It's really important to them. Right. And I think there's other agencies where it's not that big of a deal. It's part of the mix, but it's not what drives right. their budget. Yeah, for sure. I uh, On here, um, there was the comment that he made about um, 
that mule deer have been on a steady decline. Yeah, see, that's I don't understand that because all the data shows the opposite. So uh, sometimes I think it's easy to confuse mule deer on the decline with a high pressure hunt, right? If you got more hunters, you got you know, let's say you go into an area and you got twenty hunters every year that you're competing with in a, in a given spot for the deer there. Then you have a hundred hunters come in. It's going to seem like the deer on the decline. <laughs> and and some bucks are going to be removed. Whenever you yeah. go out there during the season, some bucks are not in the field anymore. Yeah. And so you may see fewer bucks in those areas. But as we discussed earlier, the statistics aren't really bearing that out. No, not. You know, we do with with mule deer, a lot of the surveys are wildlife biologists sitting on, for the for the whole survey period, about two months, sitting on a hill glassing. I mean, they... They record bucks, does, and fawns, a number of deer, and a lot of different methods, fixed wing aircraft, small Cessnas, and helicopters. And, and when you survey consistently the same time, the same way, year after year, you get a pretty good long, long-term data set to track those populations. And if there was a dramatic decline, we see it because it happens sometimes. We see it in the data. We had another comment about this data from from uh, Mr. Hamlin, and he writes, I agree with you on uh, – well, he says, mandatory harvest report would be – huge and it wouldn't be hard to make that happen but i think there would be hard facts then that the department the game department would have to answer to and changes would have to be made it's easier for fish and game to say they did a survey to get their facts also i think if they leave this hunt as an over-the-counter and you choose to hunt it then you don't enter the draw you could still build point just like a leftover hunt per se you're either in or you are out I don't ever see them limiting non-resident anything with the amount of money that it brings in. Hmm. But we got 10% non-resident caps on all kinds of things. We do limit non-resident talking about archery. Probably he's probably talking about just that archery specifically. I think the whole reason that the archery permits up archery uh, units up on the Kaibab and that Northern Arizona went to full, full blown lottery permitted was because the influx from Utah and other States. So I think that's a case where, we just went to permitting because of non-resident. Because home so much pressure. Mm-hmm. So much non-resident pressure. So we have a lot of different tools. Some people may have different ideas of different tools they want us to use. Mm-hmm. We're always yeah. considering that, but we can't We can't use everybody's idea. What do you think about that whole idea of you either do the over-the-counter and and put in for a point, or you put in for the draw and can't do over-the-counter? That's another way to limit harvest, but I, I don't, don't like that at all. I, I don't like that at all. I mean, you're just more restriction and limiting um, hunters. I've spent a lot of I, my I wouldn't just trying to keep things as flexible as possible. Right. Yeah. That would be a tough one because you, you would be, I think you We're, would be, too many people wouldn't be doing the draw anymore or they, you know, you'd limit your, your income yeah. opportunities and. Well, you'd have to, as a hunter, you'd have to make that choice. It would suck. Yeah. Wow. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can limit non-residents, limit harvest. And, and we've just tried to find the one that makes most sense. Well, Jim, I think we kind of hammered it out. We kind of hit all the top, all the bases. Mm-hmm. Uh, you answered a lot of my questions. Well, it was good to talk about some of that stuff. With a lot of people commenting about that, it's good to just yeah. have a discussion about it. It seems like. There's so many opinions on how it could be managed. Oh, I know. I everything, for a <laughs> everything comes with a with a with a pro and a con, mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. kind of have to decide what your priorities are and and what fits best. And the the problem is, is one guy might want to only hunt every three or four years, but have a killer hunt. Another guy might want to hunt every year, mm-hmm. and those two management styles are going to be different. Yep, yep. you know. It, but you offer lots of opportunities for mm-hmm. both in the state. Mm-hmm. You can keep right. applying for that one tag that gives you that sort of limited uh, pressure hunt, that, mm-hmm. uh, and and then you can still do the other tag. Yeah. Every as well. unit has a cow's whitetail hunt in December at the the like the first half of rut. Very limited number of tags, super hard to get drawn for, but you get drawn for it. And there's not very many people. There may be fifty tags in the whole unit yeah. typically. And you're you're hunting white tails with a rifle during the rut. So there's those opportunities for people that want to wait every five years and have that opportunity. I'm gonna draw one of those rifle coos deer tags. Mm-hmm. The first year I don't I don't uh tag out on a archery buck. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna put in, Go in the draw. I, I'm yeah. I've got I'm building up the points. I've got quite a few points now. 
So, so far um, you haven't had that problem. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I plan to kill one with a bow every year. That's a problem, but uh, if that's the case, I'll just keep getting points for that one time. Um, so folks can follow you on Instagram. Mm-hmm. You get on there, they can send you DMs and you questions bet. and ask you things, reach out to you directly. And your Instagram is Jim, J I M dot deer D E E R E R E right. E E. Yeah. Like John yeah, Deere, the just tractor. Like John Deere. Yeah. Only it's Jim Deere it has a John Deere logo that I've, that photoshopped into a mule deer <laughs> instead of a white tail. It's nice. You can look for that. Jim Deere. And you have uh, Deer of the Southwest is a book that you've written. Mm-hmm. Right. So Cow's White Tail in the Southwest U.S. and Northern Mexico and Desert Mule Deer. So both of those types of deer in the Southwest. And that's uh, available at my website, DeerNut.com, DeerNut.com, or any place else. It's on Amazon or any place else. I'll send autograph copies or personal inscription. Nice. Excellent. All right, man. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Dang, you bet. I appreciate it. it. Always enjoy Learned it. a lot. Folks, reach out to Jim. Got any questions? Uh, and if you want to complain, <laughs> yeah, reach out right. to Jim. No, you got my contact. <laughs> yep, you got his contact. Um, and uh, folks, good luck on your hunts. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.